Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. This is Richard Gearhart. And Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. At Passage to Profit, we're all about entrepreneurs and new businesses and protecting them with intellectual property. That's what we do at Gearhart Law. We're a boutique intellectual property firm. We deal with patents, trademarks, and copyrights, and everything else related to intellectual property. And tonight we have everyone's favorite type of guest, an investor. Yes, that word is like magic in the world (laughs) of entrepreneurs. (laughs) But. I think there's a lot to be learned about how investors think and make their decisions. Yeah, that's true. You know, they just don't hand out money like candy. There are certain things that they look for before investing their hard-earned capital. And count yourself really lucky if they're willing to listen to your pitch. (laughs) (laughs) We actually met tonight's guest at the New Jersey Technical Council Venture Conference in April, and we thought he was so great we just begged him to be on the show, and he was kind enough to agree. So he was one of the pitch judges there, and he's going to really give us a great show tonight. That's right. That was a very interesting day, by the way. Pitch applications were selected through an application process for the Venture Conference, and the winners got to pitch. There are lots of new and exciting technologies out there. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest, Rick Genzer, at Ben Franklin Technology Partners. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. What does your venture fund do? Ben Franklin is a 30-year private equity investor that gets some of its money from the state of Pennsylvania. So we're a mission-based investor that's extremely active in the early stage seed investments. So we've made a couple of thousand investments over the last many years. We currently have an active portfolio of 225 or so companies. Uh, I am in the IT area, and we have a portfolio of about 90 companies in the IT area. As we were saying before the show, that is a lot. Right? It is a lot. <laughs> yeah. So how do you yes. keep track of them, all <laughs> yeah. of them? You, know? uh, you, you don't. No, not, <laughs> not true. We, we, we do our best. You mentioned seed investing, though. That's kind of unusual for a venture fund. That's absolutely true. We are only seed investments, or rather the companies as they come to us are, are seed investments. But then, of course, we keep with them as they progress through their life cycle. Could you say what seed investment means? What it means to me means it's an early stage company that's somewhere after they've gotten their kind of first friends and family type of an investment, but they're not quite ready for more institutional investing, which is often referred to as a series A. In the IT area, we prefer it to be post-product, post-revenue, which basically means you have your product um, and it functions in some way, shape, or form, and you've begun earning some revenue in some capacity. Of course, the degree to which the, the the product is mature and the degree to which you have revenue is all debatable. So you're looking for pre-revenue companies or post-revenue companies? Like I said, post-product, that's, post-revenue. And so, so that's, okay, so, and that's your definition of seed. That's pretty interesting because I've heard different definitions of seed. Like right? I said, I, I, I'm, I'm not big on leaving these terms out and not defining them. So like I said, after you've received some round of funding and after you've created a product in some way and you've begun getting some amount of revenue. Now, we invest in four different sectors at Ben Franklin. Uh, and as a result, the definition of seed in those other in, of, in those other sectors does change. So in our life sciences area, clearly these are not post product, post revenue companies. Right. It might be years before they <laughs> yeah. earn any revenue. So again, it as a, you know, our definition of seed is is fungible. You mentioned something interesting. You said that you're a mission based fund. What does that mean? Mission based for me means that we're focused on creating jobs. We're providing a good return on the state's investment. So every five years, the ben, there are four Ben Franklins in the state of Pennsylvania. They're assessed from a private organization. And I'm proud to say that uh, Ben Franklin of Southeastern Pennsylvania has almost a four times return on every dollar we get from the state. So that means the state gives us $1 and we put back in $4 into the revenues to the state. Can you teach New Jersey how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> New Jersey has me? a... I, I, I want to learn how to do that too. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty successful at what we do. Uh, and it's, it's really remarkable. And in fact, if you were to look us up on PitchBook and you would do some analysis, you'd see 
that we're actually quite a very successful investor as compared to other VCs and the like. It's not just we're really good mission-based investors. We're good investors. You're good investors. Yeah. So what is the secret to your success? So it, interesting you should ask me that. I, I really believe that we're more about an index fund as opposed to picking winners and losers. So I'd, I'd like to pretend like I'm really super smart and I can decide whether company A and company B are better. But in fact, I think that Ben Franklin's true secret sauce is volume. Spreading your bets and diversifying. That's exactly correct. So how many companies actually make money and contribute and how many don't? The way I like to look at it is it's like a third, a third, a third. So a third of our companies are kind of in the process of failing or actively failing. About a, th- <laughs> about a third of our companies are doing somewhat okay. Uh, it's very difficult to be an early stage company. And then a third of our companies are achieving and doing well. That's really good, though, because a third is a high number for a new ventures starting out. Do you give them mentoring as well as capital? Yeah, so we we have a phrase, partners with a purpose. So we're not just, because we're a mission-based investor, we're trying very hard to help them any way we possibly can. Now, granted, all investors feel this way, but I think when you are not mission-based, you might not spend as much time with the companies that are struggling because it you're just placing your bets on the best one. At Ben Franklin, we work hard with pretty much all of our companies. So we have a mentor program. We have a venture uh, introduction program. We have a company introduction program. Uh, I take meetings with my portfolio companies all the time, and as do the other investment professionals at Ben. So we're actively working with our portfolio companies to keep them Uh, moving forward and achieving what our mission is, which is to create jobs in the state of Pennsylvania. So what does the mentorship program look like? We work with another organization in Philadelphia called PACT. And what we do is we bring volunteers who are successful business folk, and uh, we match them one-on-one with our portfolio companies. This Mentor Connect program is part of what we do, and it's free to all of our portfolio companies. It's also free to PACT companies as well. So when we were talking before, this is only available, the Ben Franklin Fund, to people in southeastern Pennsylvania. Yes, so we are geographically bound. So we only make investments in the five-county area of Philadelphia. I love to bring companies to Philadelphia. I'm I'm pretty much a homer, and I love my city, and I think it's a great place to do business. But yeah, if, if you're in South Jersey or if you're in New York City, that's where this listening audience is. Come to Philadelphia. It's a great place to do business, and, and then you, we can consider you for an investment in Philly. Now, you don't have to be only in Philadelphia. I make that point. You need to have a significant presence here. Basically, as I mentioned, our uh, mission is to create jobs, so a significant presence in Philadelphia. So we have companies that are headquartered in other countries and in other states, um, and they just have a significant presence here. Of course, we prefer you to have everybody or as much as everybody as possible, but uh, we're pretty flexible to that definition. We're here with Rick Genzer from the Ben Franklin Technology Partner Fund in Philadelphia. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhart. We'll be speaking more with Rick right after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gerhart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. After our discussion with Rick, three pitch contestants this evening. So stay tuned. They've got some awesome projects and they want to share that with you. Rick, great to have you here. Thank you've you. been through the entrepreneur ringer yourself and you've seen only a lot, 30 years of it. Only 30 years and you've seen a lot of projects. So what makes for a successful startup? So successful startups obviously uh, you know need to do something unique. 
Um, they need to do something that's defensible. So you need to be able to not only do something unique, but you then need to, once you've said, hey, this is really unique and everybody wants it, you have to be able to defend against all the other people that are going to come in and want to do the same thing. Yeah, it has to pass the giggle test, right? You have to be able to say it without giggling, and then it's a good idea, right? Yeah, the giggle test and the smell test. <laughs> well, and I know a great way to d- defend it and <laughs> protect it. <laughs> oh, right, really? Richard? Would what? that be intellectual what? property? <laughs> oh, my God, what a great idea. <laughs> Eureka! <laughs> so do you advise people to get intellectual property? The subject of intellectual property comes up all the time in the work that I did for 30 years and the work that I do now. Uh, I think in the software space, which is where I came up through, I think it's debatable, and I've had this debate many, many times. Uh, I think in the other areas, it's very, very important. Even in the software area, there are times when it's super important, and I could go through a couple of examples of that. But certainly in the case of we have some robotics companies, we have some drone companies, they really need a strong patent portfolio so that they can defend what it is that they're doing against would-be competition. Right. And I mean, for software, we were talking about it, Elizabeth and I were at a presentation this morning, and a lot of it depends on the life cycle of your product. You know, if you get your patent and it takes five years to get the patent, but in three years the technology has moved on, what good did it do you, right? So it's software applications aren't the perfect solution for every project, but you do have to make sure, number one, that somebody else doesn't have a patent that can block you, and number two, you need to get some good advice based on what you're trying to achieve, what your business model is, life cycle, what's protectable, all those kinds of things. I agree with that. I mean, the freedom to operate is important, so it's important to know that whatever you're doing, uh, you're not infringing on what somebody else is trying to do. I use a phrase, uh, the best defense is a good offense. It's important to get into the market, fail fast, do what you need to do, and if you're spending all this time worrying about your intellectual property, not that that's unimportant, but you want to make sure that you strike the right balance. You want to spend all your time on defense. You really want to get into the market and let the market tell you what it is that you need to do. So what does make for a good startup besides intellectual property? Having a good product idea, of course, is important, Uh, a strong team. I think one of the most important things I look for and what people should be thinking about is what I call domain expertise, which is different than subject matter expertise. So domain expertise says I'm in the logistics industry and I've been in the logistics industry for 20 years. I know all about it. And now I want to produce a widget that helps the logistics industry. That's domain expertise. I can acquire people such as my esteemed colleagues here today in the area of intellectual property. I can, I can acquire marketing expertise. I can acquire software development. But the domain expertise is what really differentiates people. So there, there are folks in the room. I, one of the people here has a degree in psychology and has been working with children for a long time. That's domain expertise. You can't buy that. That's something you have to acquire through time. Another individual knows a lot about fundraising in the, in the area of not-for-profits. That's domain expertise. He might be able to find somebody that's really good in the messaging area, and he could buy that expertise. But the domain expertise is a true differentiator. That's awesome advice. And I don't hear too many investors cite that as a significant, I'm weird. <laughs> a significant factor. Well, then you're in the right place, yeah, right? Yeah, what can I say? <laughs> you know, I'm in green rooms all the time with other, with other investors, and I'm often an outlier. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> But That's I'm off in LA. you on the show. Because <laughs> we're outliers uh, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are some of the screens that VCs use when they're looking at projects? So I think that's a little bit different than what makes for a good startup. What are you guys looking at when you're looking to make an investment? You use the word screen, and that's interesting. I can't really speak for other investors because, again, I tend to be a little bit of an outlier. So I'll explain it how I do this. And I basically have about two dozen risk reward variables that are sitting in my head as an amalgam at any given moment. And when a new uh, organization, new company, new business plan comes before me, I pick and choose among these two dozen or so variables, and I begin using them to try to decide whether or not the risks are too great or they're managed or whether the upside is too small or fantastic. And so it's this risk-reward balance among these two dozen or so criteria. So what are some of these factors you're looking at? Technology is a classic one. Uh, The experience of a team is another. 
Product market fit is another. There's two dozen of these, and every investor tends to be very well versed. So, so what is a real red flag when you're looking at some something you might invest in? I don't use all two dozen all the time. So a red flag in one situation might not be a red flag in another. So I'm going to use as a funny way, there's a lot of investors that will never invest in a husband and wife team. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we yeah. heard that. I, had to, I had to bring this up. But no. they will, I mean, they literally, I'm in the green room and I'm talking to these guys, I will never invest in a husband and wife team. I'm like, well, what is that about? You know, yes, you, you know, I, I just can't believe that that's an absolute definite red flag. I think a red flag would be that if there's two co-founders and I detect that there's a, a friction between them, regardless of their marital status, if I detect a friction, that is a red flag. And I'll give you an example. I am talking to the founders, we're having a discussion in my office, and one of them makes a statement, and then the other one either does A, repeats the same thing in their own words, or B, slightly contradicts what the first person said. That, to me, is a red flag. It it doesn't matter whether they're married or not. It's this whole dynamic between the two co-founders. And I just want to point out, though, that husband and wife teams on the radio are phenomenally successful. (laughs) There's a lot of love in this room. There's a lot of love in this room. You never hear the fights behind the scenes. (laughs) Nor do we want to. It is really interesting because we've had people come up to us and say, husband and wife, team at the law firm, but it works for us. And you know what? We like each other. There's advantages to having people that you really trust on your team. We're both in it for the right reasons, and we make a go out of it. So I agree with you. I could see where it would be problematic, you know, if the marriage isn't working, if uh, there's a divorce on the horizon, All of those things make business a lot more complicated. But if it works right, I think it can be a tremendous asset. So I'm going to bring this home to your point here, Richard, and it goes like this. I've been an entrepreneur for 30 years. I've been a part of very, very successful teams. I've been in part of teams that are an absolute disaster. And I will tell you that the common thread to highly successful teams, in my opinion, is when the values align. And most married couples, in my opinion, tend to share similar values. And if you share similar values, you'll be able to deal with all the picadillos that occur once the proverbial, you know what, hits the fan. Fantastic discussion, Passage to Profit, with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt and our special guest tonight, Rick Genzer from the Ben Franklin Technology Partners. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gerhardt Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearHeartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law. www.GearHeartLaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Now on to the pitch portion of our presentation. But before we start that, some vital information. Listeners or even people listening to the podcast that comes out the day after the show, listen to the pitches. It's great if you can listen to all three. And if you're just tuning into the podcast now and you did not hear our special guest, Rick Genzer, talking about what he does in Philly with startups, then you have to go back and listen to that. But anyway, um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Catch it on yes. the podcast. <laughs> yes. It'll be on, the, uh, it'll be on our website tomorrow. Yeah, so when you're listening to the pitches, please really think about which of the three you like best and go to the Passage to Profit page on the Gearheart Law website and scroll down and you'll see a contest there with the three pitches and you can click on one to vote. And that's Gearheart Law, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W. Everybody gets one vote and the voting is open for a week. So don't forget to like us too on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Since you can only vote once, you need to get your friends to vote, right? And If you're telling people after the fact, though, and they cannot remember the name of the show, just visualize yourself walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end. Passage to profit. 
And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. And now on to the pitch portion. Each contestant gets two minutes to pitch, followed by a discussion with our guest, Rick Genzer from Ben Franklin Technology Partners, and Elizabeth and I. The overall vote getter gets a professionally produced video of their pitch, a $500 value. And it goes on to our YouTube channel, too. So let's get started. Our first pitch is by a team. We have Yvette Long of Platinum Mines and Karen Kirby of Prager Meta CPAs. And they are going to talk about what they're doing. Uh, I'm Yvette Long. And where are you from, Yvette? Uh, I'm from Chester, New Jersey. Okay, great. I'm the director of Platinum Minds. It's an education leadership development organization for boys. We work with boys from our urban communities, helping them get a better education, understand leadership skills, and be instrumental in becoming leaders. And we look to provide opportunities for them to really exceed to their full potential, develop skills where they can be mentors and be instrumental in making their communities a better place. For us, we feel that it's important to help those young men that are doing well academically, but because of their environment, are challenged. So Platinum Mines provide that opportunity in three areas. We're in Morristown, East Orange, and Asbury Park. And for us, the opportunity to make sure that they can exceed and provide better resources in their communities. One of the things I thought that Karen, she's on our board, might be helpful with is that she understands our need um, to provide funding in these different areas. We have schools and other organizations and even parents that are asking us if we can expand into these other areas. And it's always uh, difficult for us. It's a challenge because we don't have the funding to do so. Um, Karen, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. My role with the organization as a member of the board is trying to help fundraise so that Yvette and her good work can expand to more communities, can expand to more programs. And so my work is to try to help her get sponsors for her events, bring in donors, bring in people that come to her events and help give her the funding that she needs to continue to expand and improve her services. Yeah, we have these wonderful boys that have the opportunity to do well academically, but they're limited by sometimes the school environment and resources. So Platinum Minds provides those educational leadership resources for them to excel to their full potential. And we would love to be able to provide that in more communities for more young boys in our urban areas. So Yvette, can you tell us some of the things that Platinum Mines has done to help some of these boys? Well, sure. Um, this is our 12th year, and uh, we have a uh, Arate Leaders Program that we provide on Saturdays from September to June. During that, as part of that, we do college prep, SAT prep, and writing skills. We do math assessments, helping them improve in math areas. And then we also do community initiatives where we, in order for us to be a leadership organization, we want to make sure that this, the young men in our program have the opportunity to be involved in their community. So we have leadership community opportunities, which we do throughout the year. So what kinds of leadership opportunities? Um, well, um, for example, we did something over Christmas. Our scholars volunteered at local churches, and they provide meals and things like that during that particular time. And then we also did something with the Ronald McDonald House. We helped feed. We made meals. Our scholars got together, and we made meals for families. And then in the spring, we did something for Father's Day. We went down, we created bags and gifts for fathers and provided those to homeless fathers. So anything that we can do in the communities where we can make sure that our scholars are instrumental, they can see their value in their communities is important to us. So what are your greatest challenges in terms of talking to potential donors to your organization? The biggest challenge is really there's so many needs and so many organizations out there, and each business kind of has what they're focusing on. So you sort of get caught in the noise? Yes. But what I've found is when I really get to talking to them about what the mission is and what, what uh, Yvette's organization does, we really get so much support. And I've found that in the three years that I've been helping her, once we get an organization in to help, they're in, and they come and they donate and they give every single year. So may I give you a piece of advice? Yes. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, <laughs> pretty well practiced in the area of trying to get through the noise and cut through. I find that uh, being able to be very crisp about not just your mission, and in the case of an entrepreneur, it might be how you articulate what your widget is or the value proposition. But in your particular case, I think it's really important to be crisp about metrics, to be able to say, what's the efficacy of this program? How many people have been through the program? 
uh, how many people have graduated in the program, what kind of success stories you've had. I heard your pitch, but you right. didn't give me those particulars. Yeah. And those are the lean forward moments that you get when, I, as an investor, or in this case, as a potential donor, I really want to understand what that is. So 12 years is good. That's a good statistic. Right how many children go through this program exactly. and, and what are the measurable outcomes. And I think it'll be much easier to sort of cut through the noise if you're able to be crisp about that. Yeah, well, we have that information on our website and it's right on our homepage because we know that that's important. So like, for example, well, right there it says we've helped over 400 boys in our program in the last 12 years. It says we have a 98% graduation rate uh, matriculation from high school on into college. We have a 100% graduation rate from high school. So those numbers are there. And we have also our parents are able to come and we have testimonials on our parents on our website as well, which is, I think is very impactful because the parents are the ones that are experiencing these changes in their sons and uh, seeing them excel academically, not only academically, but they become better young men. We, they become better leaders. We had one of our parents uh, even mentioned that their son became better big brother. You know, and that was really, you know, surprising to us because we d we weren't looking for something beyond academics necessarily as far as in the home. Uh, but the changes that we saw in the homes, I mean, it's reflected throughout the, the young man's entire life uh, in the school, in his community, in his home life. Everything improves once an, an individual feels better about himself, does better in school. We have a reading program that starts in March, goes from March until uh, June, and that helps a lot as well. It's, it's great. Great. Um, yeah. I had one question. How do you pick the people that get to come into this program? You have to be referred into the program. So you can be referred from a coach, a teacher, administrator, someone that knows your academic ability. Because we look for students that are 2.7 GPA. We used to do 3.0 GPA, but we want to give more boys an opportunity. Those who are on the fence that are really doing well, but just need that extra support to really make it through the next level. So we want to make sure we give them that opportunity. If you could send one message out into the marketplace of your for your potential donors, what would that one message be? That we change lives. Uh, we make our communities better by enriching the lives of young boys and giving them a chance to excel. I mean, what better do you want for your nation than to have everybody do well and contributing to our society? That's a great answer. Yeah, and as absolutely fascinating. So, Yvette, I'm dying to hear your favorite success stories. Oh, my God, we have so many great success stories. I mean, because our organization, the young boys in our program stay with us, they join like about sixth grade. They stay with us until 12th grade. So they graduate with us. So it's really exciting. We get to sometimes go to graduations. We hear all the great stories. But the success stories is that we also ask our scholars to be alum to our program to kind of stay with us as they go on through college. So we have mentors in our program that stay with our scholars right on through college. And that to us is not only do, is that a success for us that those, those mentors are staying with them and supporting them, but also that our scholars are getting into some of the great organizations here in New Jersey. In fact, one of our, our scholars just recently graduated and worked for JP Morgan. Wow, that's great. Um, so, and we have um, uh, several engineers just graduated. They're now down in Georgia. So, I mean, they're telling us different stories about, well, graduate business long and oh, this is where I'm going and I got a job and so we just love hearing these different stories it's wonderful this is great it's a great organization what is your website uh, it's platinumminds.org and you're really looking for sponsors at this point oh, we love to, yeah sponsors yeah. we look for mentors speakers okay. and also volunteers because like I said we have our reading program is uh, every Saturday starting in March to June helping younger boys because you know if boys can't read by fourth grade they have a 80 percent chance of going on to prison and for us you know as a leadership organization we felt that we had to do something so we that's, uh, eight years now with our reading program that's great Yvette you've also got something that really exciting going on right now you're going to be publishing a book soon yes absolutely it will be my second book my first book was helping young men make better decisions and this book will be more looking at history and how it impacts young men and some of the urban communities, helping them get a better understanding of their value. I feel like that's so important in our society and helping uh, academically have, with achievement. You know, there's a lot of obstacles and challenges to achievement these days, as we all know, like, you know, kids suffering with grief, fear, anxiety, you know, depression, those sorts of things. On top of that, for African Americans, it's, a you know, not understanding your history. So I did put together a great book. It's Helping Young Men in History. It's African American History, The Untold Stories. So it talks about, you know, stories that I feel that are not in our history books and therefore will help them with uh, self-esteem and self-efficacy. That's so. great. So what is the title of the book again? African American History, 
The Untold Stories. Excellent. And where can we get this book? Well, it's currently available on Amazon.com. Hopefully, we'll also be having that book available at Barnes & Noble and some of the other places like that as well. We look forward to reading it. Thank you very much. All right. Sure. Thank you. And Karen, what is your website for your company? I think it's wonderful that this accounting firm is sending you to help on the board with this organization. So what is your website? Our website is PragerMetis.com. That's P-R-A-G-E-R. M-E-T-I-S dot com. And our mission is to, to help organizations like Yvette's succeed. Great. You are listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710 with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart and our special guest, Rick Genzer. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventing a toz.com inventing a to z.com email me lisa at inventing a to z.com treat yourself to a day chock full of networking education music shopping and fun go to my website inventing a toz.com now back to passage to profit once again richard and elizabeth gearhart and now for our second pitch this evening we have with us eric brandt from gnosis media group gmg eric welcome to the show you have two minutes for your pitch Go. Thank you for having me. My name is Eric Bryant, and I'm the owner of Gnosis Media Group. Uh, we've been around for 10 years, and we offer text-to-donate services for nonprofits to help them raise funds. Basically, our target is smaller, successful nonprofits with revenues under half a million dollars in a year. We offer uh, text message fundraising for events for nonprofits to fulfill their missions. That sounds great. I've never heard of texting for funding. Just Nor have I. Uh, so, and so this is, I think, a very creative approach. Tell us a little bit about how it works on the back end. How do you sure. get all these text messages sure. generated and how does it work? Sure. Basically how it works is the nonprofit will choose a keyword like give or donate or something that's in their uh, organization name. And then we set that keyword up on what's called a short code, which is a short phone number, a five-digit phone number. So when people text donate to the short code, it initiates a donation sequence where it sends them a link to the nonprofit's PayPal page or whatever mobile checkout they choose to use. And the donor in a few clicks can make a donation of any amount or a recurring donation that goes directly to the nonprofit. So it's a way of making uh, the fundraising more extensible. A person doesn't have to be right in front of a computer. They don't have to have a checkbook. They have their mobile phone, which everybody carries. So if we wanted to set something up so people could donate to Passage to Profit, for example, (laughs) you're the man. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) So uh, how is this product priced and how do you make money on that? Uh, we have three packages ranging from $35 to $75 a month. Uh, it's just a monthly subscription, and that's how we make money. Uh, we also have a few add-on products like a thermometer, fundraising thermometer with mercury that rises so that nonprofits can feature it at an event. And we have... Uh, is, is that a, like a cardboard thermometer? No, or it's, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a digital thermometer that they can broadcast on a web page. That's great. And, so, and as the do- donations come in, the, th- the thermometer rises so they can show their progress toward a goal. That's awesome. So what is your success rate? I mean, do people come to you and say, wow, I raised twice as much as I normally would have? Yes, quite often. Have you thought about changing your revenue model a little bit from a subscription to a success-based? So you take a piece of the overall revenues that... It, Yes, we have, I've thought about that quite a bit. Uh, some of our competitors do that. They take a piece of each donation. We only take a piece of each donation if they use us as a payment processor because we assume more liability. In that case, we take 6% of each donation. Uh, if they use their own payment processor, however, uh, we're not off acting as a custodian of their funds, so 
we don't take any percentage. So, Eric, how do you get into this business? What what motivated you to start this? You know, that's a really good question. <laughs> I don't really know. I, I, I taught myself programming in, at nights and evenings. Basically, I'm an intermediate level programmer, and I wow. figured out that text message and SMS programming was the easiest thing that I could figure out how to do. <laughs> and so I just was playing around with that. I built all sorts of prototypes of text Path of messaging. least resistance. Yeah, path of least resistance. I built all sorts of prototypes of texting apps and that most failed. In fact, pretty much all of them failed until this one. And this popped into my head one day. I said, wow, the Red Cross has a text to donate number. There are all these other organizations that are doing offering text to give. I could build that. Yeah. And that's what started it. So what is your vision for the business? My vision for the business is to help the small, successful nonprofit because the larger nonprofits, they go to other text-to-donate vendors that allow them to have the mobile carrier be a underwriter. So it takes the donation right from your phone bill or it adds it to your phone bill. Smaller nonprofits under half a million dollars can't qualify for that. So that was my mission. And about 83% of the nonprofits in the U.S. is about 1.5 million. About 1.2 million are smaller. So my mission is to help them because I think they need the most help. So Eric, what's your largest challenge? My biggest challenge is figuring out how to increase my customer lifetime value. Could you define that term for us? I define it as the amount of revenue that a single customer will generate for your business over the lifespan of their time doing business with you. Um, I happen to know my number right off the top of my head. It's $207. Um, (laughs) That's good. That's good that you know that. That to me is when you have satisfied customers, you have happy customers, they stay on longer, they want to continue month after month. And that to me is the real measure of success that I use. So we often talk about this idea of a shopping basket size. So you have a customer acquisition cost and then you have a shopping basket size, and in this case, it's, what was it, $79 a month that you charge for the service. Mm-hmm. So one way, of course, would be to increase the amount that you get on a monthly basis, but mm-hmm. you might think about having multiple subscriptions that you might offer so you can increase your total lifetime value of a particular customer by offering them more than one of the things that you have, if at all possible. So mm-hmm. different keywords or different marketplaces or finding a way to slice and dice that, not not treating them poorly by any stretch. I'm not advocating that. I'm just simply saying focusing on this idea of not just the number of months that they stay subscribed to your service, but rather the number of things that they might subscribe to other than this base service. Oh, absolutely. That sounds like a really good idea. And I do a lot of reading on this subject every day. And one of the things I did start doing was customers can buy an additional keyword for an extra $15 a month. There you go. Customers can upsell at the, at the point of purchase an extra $5 a month for text message reminders that so go out. speaking of customers, how are you getting them? What are you doing for marketing? You have 1.2 million potential customers. Yeah. How are you reaching them? SEO and pay-per-click advertising. So another way you might consider increasing your shopping basket size is partnering with a firm that might help them in some way that relates directly to your service. So one of the thoughts that comes to mind is a a marketing firm that targets not-for-profits. You could sell your service and their service together and vice versa. They could sell your service as well. Eric, do you have any sense of how your customer lifetime value stacks up against other people in the industry? Do you think that it's just a matter of the nature of the business, or are there things that you really feel that you could do to extend it? One of the things I did to help was to create a customer service chat bot so that it's live 24-7, and I've trained it over many, many months to field frequently asked questions, and I think that has helped. I see an uptick in usage of that. Excellent. Um, that way I can answer questions when I'm not actually able to answer questions. <laughs> but I think It's I, the it, way the world is yeah, going. <laughs> I feel like it just comes down to just trying to improve the product and make it the best user experience for my customers. You talk a little bit about stickiness. You want the customers to stay with you for a while. Your shopping basket is, let's say, $79 a month. I'm assuming you perhaps have this a monthly subscription. You could offer your service at $70 a month if they sign up for a one-year subscription, and that way you're lowering the amount of transactions you have instead of these monthly billings, but you also create a sense of uh, community and stickiness to your application by saying, hey, look, you know, I'm in this with you. 
why don't you sign up for 18 months and we'll we'll give you a discount in that particular way. That way you have a little bit more assurance of your revenue and it looks a little less lumpy when you look at it on a monthly basis. Well, it's good to know that I think I'm doing the right thing. I'm on the right <laughs> track because we do have a yearly subscription where we give you a month free and we have started to see more customers sign up for that. Great discussion. And thank you, Eric, for coming on to Passage to Profit. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Visit me on the web at gmg.cm. Not dot com. Not that's dot. what everybody types in. It's <laughs> dot cm. Dot cm. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt, and we'll be right back after this moment. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gerhardt Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gerhardt Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. On our third and final pitch on Passage to Profit on WOR 710. If you have missed most of the radio show, you can hear this on our podcast tomorrow on our website. And honestly, this is a fantastic show. There is incredible information here, real strong stuff if you're trying to start a business or grow a business. I would also mention that the Gearhart Law website is a wealth of information about intellectual property. You can meet our team. You can see what is necessary to file a patent or a trademark or a copyright. You can learn a lot about the whole intellectual property process. So if you're thinking about a project or you want to start a project, go to GearhartLaw.com. G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Or you can even call the office. Our number is 908-273-0700. And our special guest tonight is Rick Genzer, who knows all about investing because he does it all the time, more than anybody I know in the Ugh. whole world. <laughs> and, and so our third pitch is by Kiran Karidi with CodeBot AI. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Richard and Elizabeth, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Yeah. I'm from Bridgewater, New Jersey. I'm founder and CEO of uh, a startup called CodeBotAI.com. What it does uh, is, uh, you know, our mission is to uh, provide automation uh, in the software development process. You know, um, as a developer, I have seen that, you know, we uh, programmers uh, try to reinvent the wheel uh, when they don't have to. And, uh, you know, um, the whole software development, uh, you know, timeline extends. So we are, pro- uh, you are trying to use uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, in our products to uh, streamline that process and, you know, minimize the timeline effort and resources. So just to summarize what you're saying, you have a software that helps write software using artificial intelligence and that uh, makes the whole software development process quicker. Exactly. So we have two products. One is out there, like, you know, it, it's not released uh, to the public yet. Uh, so what that does is, you know, it converts, uh, you know, uh, software requirement specifications into uh, programming code in multiple languages at this moment, Python and Java. So software requirement specifications are nothing but, you know, when a business, uh, you know, tries to, uh, you know, w- are working uh, towards an application, they come up with a formal document of what that application is, what it does, you know, the functionality and all that. So um, our application has the ability to understand that natural language and uh, try to and the context and try to convert into uh, you know a kind of scaffolding code. So what is unique about your product? There is no product out there which uh, you know can uh, you know create code uh, like a software which uh, which uh, writes software. Uh, so in that sense, it's very unique and also it uses uh, you know machine learning algorithms. 
so you know the more it's used the more it gets better and uh, you know it's not perfect uh, you know uh, to this state but you know eventually it will get better so and so what kind of programs has your code written so the core uh, algorithm is written in uh, python and uh, you know uh, machine learning algorithms have been used and uh, the key part of this is natural language processing so you know understanding you know the the doc, uh, the, the sentences the you know the words and the context and you know trying to uh, analyze that and convert into uh, programming code can you give us an example of a product or service that's been created using your system a product has not been uh, yet created using our system uh, recently you know uh, our startup was um, you know selected as a finalist you know uh, who are doing analysis like customer segmentation competitor analysis and all that so you know we we are still uh, you know not at that stage where uh, so still very stage, early stage. very early stage would would software developers be really nervous about your solution <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that you know i hear this uh, you know a lot but uh, you know i promise that it's not going to take away you know anyone's job it it helps a programmer to be more efficient and do you know in what they are best at so Kiran, I'm not a programmer. I have to fool around on the back end of our website sometimes, but I don't write code. I just make changes and stuff. Could I go into our WordPress website with this and say, I want to add another field here for a picture of a person? and some text. Uh, so we have a second product which we are working on. It, it, it's in very early stages, but it's more exciting than the uh, first product where you know uh, people without any coding uh, knowledge can create websites. So it's like you take a piece of uh, paper or a napkin, you know, you draw how you envision your web page is going to be like a button, text, image, and in uh, you upload that and in seconds you have the live web page along with uh, it its back end code. So we are working on it. So uh, yeah, and no programming knowledge uh, required to do that. Back in my software development days, um, we used to Staples came out with something called a easy button. And we changed. <laughs> yeah, <them. laughs> yeah, remember that? And, and and we relabeled it to the do it button. So it sounds like you're right. You're making a do it button now for uh, software. Is that correct? Yes. How do you envision this product being brought to the market and sold? So, uh, you know, the the use case is very wide. Uh, you know, we, uh, uh, it, you take any business, you know, you have, uh, you know, uh, applications that they either develop or, or use it, right? So, you know, we have a customer base, right, from freelancers to big enterprises. So we are trying to figure out, you know, should we target, uh, you know, against freelancers to start with? Um, but they don't, uh, you know, uh, follow a formal approach of, uh, you know, business business requirements specifications. Uh, but if we go to uh, big enterprises, you know, they they uh, want to have a robust application tied up to their, you know, uh, process flow. I was just going to say, do you envision a day when people who aren't software programmers will be able to create their own software? Yes, yes. That that that's what uh, our mission is. Uh, you know that that these products are targeted uh, at people you know who don't know any programming, but they can still uh, create applications. May I give you a piece of advice? Please, yes. So, as an investor, our radar goes up a little bit, and and my little radar is going up right now. We have a phrase called "boil the ocean." So, what makes me concerned is that yeah, there's no doubt in my mind, or rather, there's no doubt in your mind that you think this software can do pretty much anything. But my advice to you is to be think very narrow. Think about very, very, very specific use cases and very specific users of your software and develop skins or customizations or configurations that talk directly to those people. There's no doubt that if this software is successful, it could maybe potentially boil the ocean, but you don't want to be that kind of arm wavy and think it can do everything. Yeah, I, I agree. If, if it were possible for people, though, just to do the simple thing, or the, it's maybe not simple, but create their own websites without having to have programming knowledge, that would be such a, a powerful tool. And I, I think if you look at the evolution of website development over time with Wix and some of the other sites, it has gotten simpler and simpler, but it's still kind of a complicated thing. And so we certainly wish you luck in your quest to achieve this goal because I think things could develop so much more quickly if we didn't just rely on software programming, but other people who have other perspectives could create software that could be used. So I have a question about the whole website thing. So I created a website in Wix, but I didn't have any SEO on the back end, or I never saw the back end because Wix does all that, right? So if I'm doing my own website, I want to get organic results. So I want Google 
page titles and all that. I want the Google spiders to find me. So how would I do that with the software? Um, so there are certain, uh, you know, pieces that Google look for. So, you know, if we incorporate that uh, into, you know, when, when, you know, that web page is created or a website is created, uh, then to a certain extent you get that SEO value. Um, you know, that, that, that's how uh, WordPress is very popular because, you know, it, it's SEO friendly. Uh, but you know, uh, it you know, no one can guarantee that you know uh, results will be up there on Google. Uh, but you know, to the extent possible, there are different you know plugins in case of WordPress, which will help you know add more SEO value uh, to the website. So, what is your biggest challenge? So, uh, my biggest challenge is uh, you know uh, to acquire uh, initial set of customers. Uh, you know. Who, whomever I have pitched to, you know, everyone is saying that, you know, it's an amazing product, but, you know, we are trying to find the right use case, as uh, Rick suggested. The, the use case is very wide across industries. We want to see how we can focus and uh, target one specific industry in a niche area and probably expand from there. I'm really intrigued by this idea that it listens and understands natural language and can turn natural language into code. That's a pretty, it's a pre pretty compelling value proposition. Yeah, how well does it understand that? Because I think Richard tried to say something and it came out yellow hat, but it was supposed to be something completely different. <laughs> I do different. a lot of dictation yeah. into my, my iPhone and it's still not perfect yet, right? How about all the cursing that I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing is perfect. You know, natural language has its ambiguity. Uh, so, you know, it, it will try to understand, you know, to the extent possible. I am fascinated by this and I don't know. I'm hoping that like when I'm 85 or 90, I still have enough mental capacity left to make my own website because that sounds really fun. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to wrap up. So uh, we have been listening to Karan Karidi, Passage to Profit on WR710 with Richard Elizabeth Gearhart and our special guest, Rick Genzer. We are going to a break. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearhart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearhartLaw.com. At Gearhart Law, we have years of experience protecting protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. Imagine being able to speak to a computer and have it write software. That's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope... That's your dream? <laughs> One of them. <laughs> well, it's a good, pretty good dream, that's for sure. So remember, everyone... Go to the Passage to Profit page at GearheartLaw.com, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W, and vote for your favorite project. So to summarize, we had a vet long with Platinum Minds, and she was here with Karen Kirby from Prager Metis CPA. We had Eric Bryant with GMG, which is Gnosis Media Group. And when you're looking for him, remember, it's not .com, it's .cm. And Avets was .org. I saw that on the program. I thought that was a typo. I know, and you fixed it, and I had to change it back. So, <laughs> and then finally, we had Kiran Karidi with CodeBotAI.com. And they're all on the website, so vote for your favorite. Now, Google Passage to Profit and make your choice. Remember, you can only vote once, and you have until next Sunday at 8 p.m. to vote. This evening's pitch contestants will receive a Passage to Profit t-shirt, and the best overall vote getter for the show will receive a professionally produced video of their pitch, a five $500 value. And before we sign off, I would really like to thank everyone who tromped down to the iHeart Studios here in Tribeca and participated. And we just love hearing these pitches each week. I agree that they were wonderful. And I also want to thank our guest, Rick Genzer from the Ben Franklin Technology Partners. Rick, do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners before we sign off? I think that all the entrepreneurs did a great job. I certainly learned a lot as I listened to them. I think that the key is to have a lean forward moment in how you're pitching to make sure that you want to compel somebody to really listen to what your pitch is. I think that you want to tell a good story. 
And I think you need to be very clear about your value proposition. And I think that all three of you did some form of all three of those things. So I congratulate you. If you have a business that you want to locate in Philadelphia or want to talk about entrepreneurialism in general, just find me at SEP, that's short for Southeastern Pennsylvania, sep.benfranklin.org. So we also have more people to thank. Our media maven, Kenya Gibson, who is wonderful. Our fantastic producer, Noah Fleischman, who always makes us sound good. And he's smiling right now, by the way. He loves hearing (laughs) this. He's (laughs) scrumptious. And Rob Barrett's our fantastic engineer, who we really missed last week, but he's back, and we're so glad. And the whole iHeart team. So don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. And listeners you can start thinking about what your pitch will be. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeartRadio with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, the voice of New York. 